very glad I get to be here today. Um, what Rajan first talked to me about was talking about the practical part of how does this really look in the clinic. And I was just going to title my whole talk, So What? Um, because we've heard some really amazing things from great speakers. And um, the challenge that I find when I do that is to, when I get back in the clinic, what does that actually look like? How do I take all this great information and um, have it apply to the person in front of me? Um, Theoretically, I guess not. I'll do it that way. Um, so a little bit about things that you need to know is that I do teach a class in pelvic pain, um, pain in general, and what to do about it with Carolyn Van Dyken. Um, do get some royalties from the book. I think the joke is that if everyone in the room bought one, I could get a cup of coffee from Starbucks. So it's not great. Um, have a clinic in Chicago that we modeled after essentially what I'm going to talk about um, on purpose designed it to, to take advantage of everything we know about the pain science. Um, Benson, you're going to meet in a little bit, and that's Karen Litzy's cat, who um, is making his official debut as a model. Um, and the jewelry is by Brawny, so you should see her, because it's lovely. There. Now you guys know everything. Um, so when a person comes to my clinic, what do, how does this start? What do we take the pain science, what do we do with it um, to make it make sense? And I start that with a question that I learned from an occupational therapist in my very first job out of PT school a million years ago. And he started by saying, well, you know, what if we just ask them what their goals are? That, we haven't gotten very far in healthcare if we're still talking about this weekend about we should have a patient uh, relationship and we should ask them what their goals are. But it's, it's still right. And so I ask the person, what does better mean to you? because I want their definition of better, not my definition of what better is for them. And how will you know when you get there? What, is, what does it look like? What are the goals we're going to make between here where you are and here where you want to go? And I have them tell me what those steps are. Um, if I guess it's going to be wrong, if I try and just use in physical therapy, we have to use all of the objective measures so that we meet the insurance requirements. Um, but those don't really fit the person in front of you's life. They may not care about their score on the s Westry. They might care very much about being able to clean their car, and that's not any on, on any of the tests. So asking the person in front of you, and then remembering that there is a huge difference between empathy and sympathy. Brene Braun does that gorgeously in the videos that she has and the workbooks and classes she teaches. Where sympathy is something where you will tell someone, um, you know, the, the at least, like, you know, you know, my dog died. Well, at least you have another one. That's not terribly nice, but you could perhaps be a little more empathetic and understand that they really, really are upset by that. The reflective listening that Ronnie talked about earlier. Um, what that does with your patient is create some trust or your client. Because people don't come to me if they're feeling good just to feel better. They come to me because something's either hurting or not working well. I have highly motivated patients because if any of you in the room have ever, I don't know, sat down without hurting, you will know that that's kind of fun. Certainly having sex is a good thing and you might want to be able to do it. And that's the kind of thing I get to get my patients back to. So they may not be terribly excited about working for eight hours a day, but it's highly motivating to do some things in life. Um, and it should be fun. But most of my patients come in looking pretty much like that. Um, little stinky, little grumpy, not quite happy with what's going on in their life, and, and wondering what it is you're going to be able to do to help them. You know, well, you got all this fancy knowledge, you go to all these conferences, how is that going to apply to my life and what can I do about it? So I try and take that face and make it go away, no matter how adorable it is. And I said that we do it by, on purpose. So there's a look, probably a couple of years ago, at the lobby of our clinic. Um, and it's done in a way that you come in and just sit down. So you think, I'm going to physical therapy. It's sort of surprising to walk into something that looks more like a loft than someplace with treadmills. And there is no ultrasound machine in our clinic. Um, the, there will be when I stop drinking Starbucks coffee long enough to save 20000 or so dollars a real-time ultrasound machine, which is completely different. They're very expensive. Um, but what we did with this on purpose, from the color of the walls, which look a little yellow there, but they're a nice creamy latte color, 
uh, to the exposed beams on the ceiling and everything that we have is to create a sense of calm when someone walks in. It's a challenge, right? Because you don't want that really crazy spa-like place where it, it looks like you've spent a lot of money and then they wonder why they're paying you that much. Because it's, So we, we want nice but not too nice, comfortable but not boring, and did it on purpose. Because what it does is what happened the first time a guy came with our UPS order and he sat down in the chair and said, wow, this is nice. And I thought we nailed it because the UPS guys never sit down and they're always in a hurry. And if his thought when he walked in that door was, I'm going to sit here a little bit, that was really cool. So I get someone that comes in in pain and they're not looking forward to coming to me. Um, and they come in and they go, oh, well, this doesn't suck, which is kind of nice. Um, and then what? Then what I do about it is put the, put the practical part into pain science. And this is, I could have um, just had one handout or one slide, this would have been it. Because this essentially is my thought process in treatment. And we've talked today about don't forget the body. Don't for, I mean, it's really, I'll, I'll quote Mick Thacker here, and don't forget the human in front of you. And that we're, we are always dealing with all of it. There's, um, muscles, nerves, connective tissue, bones, the lymphatic system, and I, you cannot put your hand on someone and not be affecting that person. All of the studies that are coming out are showing that what we do in therapy has nonspecific effects. And there's some people that think that's a kind of a threatening thing. I find it very exciting because it means I don't have to worry about if my hand is in exactly the right spot to get exactly the right force through exactly the right segment because it probably doesn't matter. And I'm very lazy, that's nice. So what I do when I do my eval, after I've asked them, you know, what's better mean to you? How are, we gonna, how are we gonna know when we're there? Is then I have an assessment going on in my head of how much of what I see in this person in front of me is a peripheral issue of um, stiff muscles or nerves that don't want to slide and glide through their system or not that there's an optimal posture but what works best for them and can they achieve it. Uh, those tissue issues that are really real, um, deconditioning, weakness, fear of movement, all of those things fall into that bucket of sort of peripheral mediators for their pain. In pelvic pain that would be asking them about sitting and and can you have sex? And does it hurt when you have a bowel movement? And all of those things, um, walking, squatting, lunging, things you do every single day. And then the central mediators are, how do they feel about it? What, what are their beliefs? What are their expectations? What, um, how scared are they? And the good thing is we don't have to guess because we have tools that we can use to measure these things. And I, th I think that this could be done in any setting. That whether you're in acute care or a massage therapist or a physician and you get 10, I was gonna say 10 seconds, it's not that bad yet, right? Um, 10 minutes with someone, then you can all do it because it's sort of a framework that we look at people through, a, a, a guide to assess them. So you have to remember that doing that, you're also asking how important is it not only to your form you need to fill out, but to that person itself, themselves. Uh, how much does all of this matter to them? Because I might be very concerned that they can't sit for more than 10 minutes, and as I said earlier, they may not really care. In the pelvic health world, and we see people, bef men before and after prostate surgery, um, sometimes the guys really, really care if they're leaking. Sometimes they don't. And we have to ask them, because it's their goals, not ours. That all folds into everything you do. Maslow did his hierarchy of needs a very, very long time ago. And I think it's all still very accurate. Uh, what we added, and this get credits to uh, Dr. Melissa Farmer, who's up in Chicago with Apcarian's group. And she presented this slide at a conference and said that when we hurt, especially in pelvic pain, we lose out on some of the things that are inherently supposed to be pleasurable. And I love that my job is that I can say this to my patients and, and they are not shocked, but 
any time, especially you guys, you have gone in and had an absolutely wonderful bowel movement, that's pleasurable. And you all know that it is. When you have to pee really, really bad and you finally get to, that's pleasurable. Sex is supposed to be pleasurable. If it's not, you can see Sarah and I, and Karen if she's here, and the other pelvic health therapists in the crowd, and we'll talk to you more about that outside. Because um, that's a whole nother talk. But trust me on that one. Uh, and so if you lose that, if you lose the, the things that are inherently supposed to be pleasurable, breathing, it's supposed to feel good. Um, when, they, when the thing that is happening with you prevents that from being comfortable, not only are you in pain, but you've lost part of your reward system. And what, when we've talked throughout the weekend about the things that keep us healthy is not just avoiding pain, but also being functional, being able to cope with what you have. So it, it's sort of important. What we do, what I do in how, how I integrate all of this together, it comes from my background in neuro, because I started in adult and pediatric uh, neuro disabilities. And it includes all of the sensory integration and motor control and um, body awareness. And, and you can take that and blend it. The, talk that you're going to get next on Feldenkrais is a gorgeous example of what we can do to put body awareness and movement into the system. And I, I would be remiss if I left Louis Gifford out of any discussion about pain and functional aspect of pain science. Uh, and his phrase of that this is complex but not complicated. The other thing to really remember is it's a constant feedback and feed forward system. So every change we make to a person changes that person. And it's going to change the output, and that's going to change their response. And those are all, I think, targets of opportunity in the clinic. We can work on, and I, I should have changed that one too. I was going through and, and washing these slides and taking systems out, because I really want to start thinking more consistently in myself of just that whole person. Um, so yes, it's the nervous system that is involved in pain, but there's a lot more to us than, than that. Um, we have our beliefs, we have our thoughts, we have everything we've gone through in the past, uh, both peripheral and central pain uh, mechanisms and um, neglect and ownership changes. Now sometimes, if you've worked in strokes or uh, with any neuro rehab, neglect and, and ownership issues make sense. But when you think of someone that's been in pain for a long time, you have to remember that too. Because often they will either overthink about a part or not want to think about it at all. And we hear about that in the words that they use when it's that leg or my stupid arm or those kind of things, those are cues that they probably don't want that bit to be associated with them anymore. And those are just targets of opportunity. So I said that we had ways to measure it, and one of my personal favorites, and I will admit straight up, I hate using these forms. And the only reason that I use objective measurement forms in the, in the clinic is one, Medicare makes me, and Carolyn Van Dyken would hurt me if I stopped, because she uses them very consistently, and I have learned from working with her over the years, as it, they are such great tools to target your treatment. The pain catastrophizing scale is free for anyone to use. It's been validated in a lot of different settings and it's available in different languages. So if you're going to use a tool like this, it needs to measure the right thing and it needs to be valid for your population. But what it can tell you is when you break down the, the results of this test, it'll tell you if they're magnifying what's going on with them. And that gives you something to do about it. You can teach them what pain is about. You can teach them that they're inherently safe. You can teach them how to move. You can use statistics that say, look, when you bend like this, it creates more space around the nerve root. You can give them that information to make them feel safer. And that should bring down the magnification. If they're constantly thinking about it, we have a lot of different tools we can use to get them to distract themselves or to uh, find a positive affirmation, the, the ACT and CBT can come in exceptionally good there. I consider myself like CBT light, and it's on my list to go do more training. Um, 
Helplessness is huge, and it's why I like the PCS a lot. We heard um, Dean Tripp, who's a psychologist from up in Canada, and he made a point at a conference I was at that one of the largest uh, indicators, the most consistent indicator of suicide with persistent pain is helplessness. And we can pick it up and get a clue from the pain catastrophizing scale. And I said I'm lazy, so if there's one scale that's going to give me something to change how I talk to people and possibly get them to a referral source if it looks like they're in a very bad spot, then I want to use it. Um, but we can also tell when someone's scoring high in helplessness to get them the help they need. My therapy and treatment will do a whole lot better if I have a team helping that person get better. And I know very much where my edges are. Working in pelvic pain, you need to know where you're comfortable starting and stopping. I'm okay talking about just about anything about sex and bodily functions, but if you get to the point where you're going to ask me what goes where and what feels better, there's this whole field of sex therapists that I will refer people to. Um, there are some PTs that will do a lot more of that than I do, or, or even less, but we work together to get it all to work. So you do your eval and you're working through and you say, okay, well, I know there's some both peripheral and central uh, sensitization and issues going on this. One thing that I try and tell my patients a lot is it's normal when you get injured that you get some sensitization. That's not a pathological state. That's how we get to take care of ourselves. That's where, how our, our system gets our attention so that we do what we need to do. Um, but it's not normal to stay like that. It's not normal to get stuck there. So what we can do is recognize the signs and help them by designing treat treatments that target the right tissue. Um, cat catastrophization can be normal and it's lending into that conversation that we had earlier that Bronnie talked about and we heard about ACT is that there can be a coping strategy that might be really, really helpful for them. And I think we can help them find it pretty easily. So I don't spend a lot of time in treatment talking to people. And I know that was a comment someone made earlier about as a massage therapist, you get that initial encounter and then a lot of the time you're, you're not talking and educating, except for that what we can do is take all of these words and these thoughts and blend them into every word we use so that when we talk about movement, we're talking about it in a way that is supportive of good movement. When we talk about, they come in and say, wow, I mowed the lawn and it really hurt, you can help them figure out what their beliefs are about that and what they might need to do. And I think that every encounter we have can support that solid biopsychosocial approach. Um, we do have some studies to back it up, particularly in pelvic pain of we know that, so PBD is, is provoked vestibulodynia. That's a lovely test where someone takes usually a Q-tip and they poke the vulva to see if it hurts. Um, it's not supposed to, and, and normally it doesn't, but what Dr. Picall did is she did some studies, a series of tests, and she found through functional MRIs that then in these ladies with provoked pain that there was a positive response, not only peripherally in the tissues themselves, but also the brain was responding, as we would expect, and shoulder pain and back pain and some bladder area pain in these people. It's the same thing we know when they, anyone with fibromyalgia hurts in a bunch of different places. So we know it's both, and that's to, sort of to point out my, it's always all of it. It's not just the body, it's not just the brain, it's the human in front of you. And we're starting to get some really good information on that. Greg was talking about, about movement and how there isn't, there isn't a normal or a perfect movement. There's just the next movement, and we want to get it going. But sometimes they're afraid to do that. So there's ways to check and ways to ask them. Are you, are you afraid to move? What is it that's in your way? How do you feel about it? As Bronnie said earlier, um, and then get them to tell you more. And I won't sing either. You don't want that. Mm -mm. Not my skill. Um, so my patients, when I, when I talk to them, the, the other thing I tell them was one of my favorite studies is this one where this group took uh, needle EMGs and put them really everywhere, but also the pelvic floor muscles, and then showed them a threatening image 
and their pelvic floor muscles contracted, which is absolutely wonderful because they're about as long as your finger, and, and they're going to protect you from that image over there by, by tightening up. Probably has an evolutionary reason for doing that. I would suppose it's so that when you're running away from what's threatening you, you're not leaving a pee trail because then they'd be able to find you. Um, but, but that's still what happens. So even now, when, if you get scared and your pelvic floor contracts or you get excited and your pelvic floor contracts, that's good unless that happens to make you hurt. And then that's really not good. And you can get so wound up in that response that you just look at a chair and hurt um, because you know that the last 22 times you sat in a chair, you hurt. So now this really brilliant system is going to say, I'm just going to make you hurt when you even look at them. And then you won't sit at it because that didn't go well last time. So we make it not happen. It, it's, it's something we can change, though. And I keep going back to that's a target of opportunity. Because if we can find the problem for them, then we can change the problem. And we can do that using all of the science that we have. So if looking at something creates a threat, then we identify it and we change it. And knowing that the person is more than just those tissues that hurt, it is also that sensitized system and the protective system and their beliefs and their thoughts and their experiences. And we design something that addresses the whole person. And that's my so what slide. Um, if pain is produced when the body or any spot in it is perceived to be in danger and, and an action is needed, that organism's gonna come up with something to do about it. Our therapy approaches can be done in a way that are purposefully not threatening. I'll, I'll give Diane Jacobs a plug on that one with the manual therapy course she teaches. The whole purpose of it and is to feel good, which is pretty awesome because there's manual therapy courses out there that are just lie there while I make this all hurt really bad because that will get you better. Um, it's like m different massage techniques, uh, and I'm not a massage therapist, but it, there are people who really enjoy that deep tissue massage. I don't. I feel like I'm getting beat up. I like the ones that feel good. But there are people who really enjoy it, so they should have that. Um, when I get someone coming into the clinic, you remember that study where if you feel like you're going to be threatened, your pelvic floor contracts. So if you're having pelvic pain and someone says, well, you have to go to this physical therapist and they're going to help you get better by doing this manual therapy technique that hurts. What do you think the pelvic floor is going to be doing when you come in the office? And that's part of why we have the office set up the way we do. So they come in, they're already expecting something clinical, and they come into our nice little loft, and I start to win already because they relax a little bit. And then I ask them questions instead of starting to do a physical exam, and I win a little bit more because they relax a little bit more. And then maybe even sometimes I didn't even touch them the first visit. If they're sitting in the corner like this, I already know everything's going to be tight and scrunched, and they already know that I'm going to hurt them. So when I don't, I win a little more. And then give them some movement, some things that feel good, and they go away thinking, I am very strange. <laughs> but they'll come back, and then I get them. Um, <laughs> but what if... What if we could do that? What if we could make our therapeutic approaches not only not painful, but actually fun and, and feel good? Because on the other side of not pain isn't just this blissful neutral spot. And when you've been in pain a long time, that blissful neutral spot is amazing. But there's also pleasure and fun and anticipation and excitement. And I don't think that we're we, great, get them here, but then aim for that because life's messy and they'll hurt again and they need to know how to adapt and cope and handle flare-ups. And I want, I want all of it. So how do we do it? Well, we bring in that neuro from, from everything you know and start getting motor activity and sensory awareness. And we get movement. I love that Todd goes after me because I, I got to knowing that, took out slides. Um, uh, because he's gonna talk about movement that is fun and novel and is supposed to feel good and the expectation is that 
it's enjoyable. So simple example of self-awareness, and I know you're both saying, okay, I'm gonna put you through what I do with my patients. This is not going to be a pelvic exercise. <laughs> Good, if you're bored. But if you close your eyes, and I can see, so don't cheat. Close your eyes and take your right thumb and touch your pinky of your right hand with your right thumb. Okay, without opening your eyes, how do you know you did that? Because you could, yeah. So the cool thing, you can open your eyes now because you'll fall asleep and that would be bad. The, the cool thing is that you did that. So I said words and you heard them and that meant something to you and you did this really cool thing and you knew you did it. That is actually pretty astounding because you also didn't make those go because otherwise it would have been all of them. So there was the very, my, my patients get this down and dirty um, biology. So that's like a, a go message and that's the don't go messages. Inhibition's really important when that's what's necessary. Facilitation's really important when that's not what's necessary. When it's messed up, that doesn't work well. And you, we try and find those things that aren't right and get them back to right again. So that's sensory awareness. You can do that. Um, if I was very clever, this would be a Dr. Seuss poem. You could do it sitting on a ball. You could do it against a wall. You could do, it really doesn't matter. And any movement, any awareness, any mindfulness exercise will get you to this spot if you um, exploit it. It's all very manipulative. And the more I get my patients doing of that, the less work I have to do, and I really am lazy. Um, so it's tools from classic rehab. This is, this is what, how I was raised in therapy, to take what you do, take what you want to teach them, and put it in a really nice environment that they like, not what you like. Now I did, we got, we got a little all posh and made our environment the way we wanted it and didn't ask our patients, but, um, but it's nice and it's comfortable. And when I get my patients to start to do things that might be challenged for them, I want them to go do that in their favorite place. Sit, start sitting in your most comfortable chair. Um, oh, we could make great jokes about that with sex. Start, start with your favorite boyfriend. Um, do, you know, find a way to grade it where you start where it's not, I'm gonna start with the hardest, but I'm gonna start with the most fun. Um, make it different. That goes right back to that. See, pelvic health is fun. We can make great jokes. Um, make it different. If you usually do your, your yoga at a studio, then maybe go to a different one. See if that different teacher or the different place is enough to make a change to where now you can tolerate something that wasn't tolerable before. Do it with other people. Or if you've been doing it with other people, do it by yourself. And make sure that what you're doing is fun. So these is the homework my patients get. And do you know how sad it is when I can look at someone and say, what do you do for fun? And they have absolutely no answer. And what do you enjoy? And if you had five minutes during the day to do something that was just sensual and wonderful that you just loved, what would that be? And they can't tell you. That's been a really long time of not experiencing any pleasure. And that could be just you know, eating your favorite ice cream or, or smelling a flower or petting the cat. Um, but, but sometimes people get lost in, in the dysfunction and forget that there are strengths and positive things even within it. Why do I care? Because if I can get them to do something, to self-identify something they like, it's not me telling them, and to do it for five minutes a day, and I swear I did not know Bronnie did that with her um, dancing. Um, that's dancing. The, um, then, then they're getting the chemical response I want. They're getting serotonin and dopamine. They're getting a self-efficacy that helps them. They have control over it. They've totally bought in to the fact that I can help them, which means I can probably help them. Because remember, I'm trying to get Benson's stinky face gone and get them over to my side. So, but I also want them to know what they're doing and to know why they're doing it. So yes, I will set up environments that subconsciously make them relax, but I also tell them. Because I want them to go do that at work or at home. Because if we can take advantage of the environment, that's the social part, um, then we should. And 
you're more likely to do something if you understand why you're doing it. But I also want them to do it with consistency and sufficient load to actually make a change. And as any of us know that ever have physical goals, like my uh, running the 10 mile in May and we're running out of time because my running program is getting sparse. Uh, it's not, you're not gonna make change if you don't load it enough and do it consistently enough to, to get there. That's why we ask in the beginning, what does better mean to you and how will you know when you get there? Because I have to design a program that's gonna be challenging enough to get there, but not so challenging that it makes it so they won't get there. It's, you just ask them, they know the answer. So this all leads into that conceptual change theory where we have to address the threats, we have to identify them, we have to make them functional. But consider that your therapeutic intervention isn't just your technique. It's also the space you're in, it's the clothes you wear, it's the sound of your voice, it's your receptionist, it's the traffic on the way to your office. There's all of those things that are part of what happens and what goes into it. And the most important thing is that their perception of how they're doing is going to be their own and we may guess wrong. So there's a, I can't remember the name of the, the fallacy, but it's that thought that my worldview is the same of any, as anyone else's worldview. It's, it's not, but that's kind of how we're wired to think. So this is one of my favorite reminders of that. Um, when I teach with Carolyn, we have fun with this one because I look at that and when I see that, I want to go run out in the middle of it and jump up and down and see how much that bridge will go. My um, younger son would run out in the middle of it and in his squirrel suit jump off of it. It's a little weird. Um, and there are people who would absolutely not even want to look at it. And I can't, I can't tell them they're wrong. They would just lose out on the fun in the middle. Um, and we have to remember that our perceptions and our, our thoughts aren't our patients. So it goes back again, just ask and let them tell you. So we have been, um, was up at our national conference last week uh, that was the intimate party of 13,000 or so people. And some of the questions we were getting around pain and why to do pain education sounded to me like people were treating it like, well, we have this biopsychosocial bit and then here's the bio bit and we're really good at it. And then there's this psychosocial thing that we might sometimes get to if this part doesn't work. And what I think needs to happen is that we have to remember that it's always all of it. Um, and pain education isn't a thing you go off somewhere and do. It's just sort of part of how those words I use. I don't say, wow, it looks like your back's out. Um, because one, we know that can't happen. And that's a scary thing. I don't tell people, you'll never be able to sit again. Um, because we don't know that's not, that that's true and I can probably change it. So sometimes the, the how to integrate pain uh, education into the clinic isn't a class, it's just the attitude and the words and the environment that we use to take the threat out of it, to give them some self-efficacy and to help them understand that the longer it's gone on, the less likely it is that their pain is because those tissues haven't healed but it could very well be that there's some weakness or stiffness or something in there that we have to take care of and also address that top-down part. So it's all of it. I call it blended, where it can be just enough education to review, reduce the fear and get them moving again. Um, and there's been some, some studies done on it. Adrian Lowe is doing a lot of work looking at what happens if we get education about what pain is anyway. No, no pain message, no pain track, all of that stuff. Um, two people before they have surgery, will they come out of the surgery better? Uh, will they have less, less fear going into it if they know normal healing time, what to expect, all of those things. I'm an old enough therapist, I thought that's what we did. Because when I was in school, that's what we did. And then it sort of fell apart and now everyone's going, hey, we should teach people, <laughs> which is funny. I guess it's like pant styles. Um, but <laughs> it'll come back. The, but we had, so it's currently not happening in the US that all of that is going on before surgery. It's currently not happening in the US that 
people are being encouraged to move consistently and to not be afraid to move. So we have to, we have to blend that into our treatment. One really good way of doing that is working with imagery, and that can be the graded motor imagery like Lorimer Mosley and David Butler work on, or it could be imagery of mindfulness and body awareness like Eric Franklin. I'm not gonna talk about any of the other ones because I'm gonna let Todd grab the rest of that. Um, but it's so incredibly powerful when you can get someone comfortable and confident in their own body, know where it is, and know what normal feels like in there. We can progress it. I think I left these slides as my, my public ones. Because, so if you're familiar with the graded motor imagery from David Butler and Lorimer Mosley, it's all done on arms and legs. Um, so I do pelvic health and it lends itself to great work of, we really, girls, don't have a visual representation of the inside of our bits. Because you don't look at, sometimes not even your own, certainly not all of your friends. Um, we make a very strange locker rooms. Boys have visual representation. Um, boys know that they all come different shapes and sizes and all of that. Uh, so it, it, that can help. You know, if you have a visual representation of something and then it starts to hurt and you look at it, you'll know whether it looks like it used to. And that's a really good comforting thing. But if it's in a part of you that you've never looked at before and you don't know what normal looks like and you don't know what anyone else's looks like, and dear God, don't Google, Google it because that's not normal. Um, <laughs> the, it, doesn't, it doesn't help. And it can actually, instead of comforting you, can scare you. So we have to catch that and fix it before it gets wrong. And by fix it, I just mean give them accurate information. So laterality reconstruction, probably not a thing in public health. Um, motor imagery is really just watching movement. That gets funny for us too, right? So it hurts when you have sex. What do you tell them to do? That's go. You, if you're like, it hurts if I climb stairs. The classic thing we say is go, you know, sit at the mall and watch people go up and down the stairs and see how they're fine and they're happy. It hurts when you have sex, what? That's, just go to your neighbors. Um, sorry. So in my spare time, when I'm not at work, I do a little bit of stand-up in Chicago. And it's not very polite stand-up. Um, so I'm trying to refrain. So um, mirror therapy in pelvic health is another thing we don't do because where would you put the mirror? And we don't have a right and a left, but what we can do is take the ideas. We can take the concept of, of imagery like Eric Franklin does and, and a lot of the other mindfulness things. And we can take the concept of graded <laughs> exposure, um, thinking of it more of a, a not willingness to think about that part because it's either too sensitive or you just don't even want it there, um, to, to get them back to something that's more functional and more in the middle range. Setting functional goals, asking them what their goals are. So how do, you do, how do you do practical pain science in the clinic? Ask your patient or your client, and they'll tell you. Um, establish some sort of control or coping strategy where when things start to ramp up, they have something they can do to bring it back down. And I am really, really, uh, I try that very hard with my, with my patients to give them things that they can do for themselves because I want them better. I don't want them to have to have my magic hands to get there. I mean, they're great, and they're really good short term, but I'm keeping them. They don't get to take them with them when they go. Um, and then we want to break down the goals so they have a safe starting point that they can confidently build on from there. Advancing the movement, pretty classic. For the PTs in the room, this is what we do. So, oh, you want to get back to running. OK, here's your program. Um, but we can do that in a way where we'd be very, very careful and sure to provide a lot of different experiences so that their confidence grows more and more. So the general rule, we identify the threat. We want to do things that are healthy for them. These are really easy. And the, the uh, psychoneuroimmunology was a, a thing and still is that we were looking at of how does this affect um, so how do our thoughts affect what's happening in our body and the motor control and the sensory awareness? Um, it still seems to come down to some pretty basic things about get good food in there, 
get enough sleep, do some fun things with fun people, and get moderate exercise. So that's all, that's all things we can do and we can support no matter what your, your license to work with people is because that, that's just the stuff we learned in kindergarten. So we've gone through a quick little run of what do we look at. We look at the peripheral issues, movement, stiffness in the tissues, things moving or not moving. We looked at how they think about it and what their beliefs are and what this, this is is I use that, or Carolyn and I use it to, when we, we talk about if you draw a line kind of straight down from the top to the bottom where you think they're more, like is this mostly an acute ankle sprain and it's a lot of local tissue problems, then you're gonna be over here in your treatment. And there might be some catastrophizing, there might be some, oh my God, I've got this big trip coming, it's not gonna go well, you could help them relax about that. You could give them some coping strategies for well, if you're in the airport, go ahead and get a wheelchair or do those things. But predominantly your treatment's gonna be pretty biomechanical, um, loading the tissue and getting the strength in it. But what if you know, 12 years later they still have ankle pain, you know those, those tissues might be a little out of shape, but really they're healed, as healed as they're gonna get, but they may be massively catastrophizing over it, constantly thinking about it, not wearing shoes anymore, and have had these, these adaptive mechanisms that didn't help. So we want to bring them back down. Most of my, my patient load is about half and half, even my 12 years on with pain. There's muscles and ligaments and nerves and things that need some help, and there's a lot of top-down beliefs about not being able to do it. So I set the treatment to address the problems, and it's always wrapped in that, what are we doing, what do we know about pain? And if I do it right, then we go from the stinky cat face to that one, where they can just chill out and enjoy their shows and do what they, they need to do to stay healthy. Um, so my questions for you guys, this is my what's next. What I see in the clinic is a, you get someone that comes in and they've been hurting for a long time and they anticipate that they're gonna feel bad. They, they know that, they know it's gonna hurt, that what you're gonna do is gonna hurt, they know that they're gonna do these movements or you're gonna work on them and they're still gonna hurt and they're still not gonna be able to sit or ride their bike or whatever it is they wanna do. And you work on them and they get incrementally better and incrementally better and then suddenly this thing happens that I don't know what to call it um, and it switches. And now they get pissed off when they hurt because they thought, man, it didn't hurt yesterday and now I did this and I hurt. What? what, is it all gonna come back? What's wrong now? And that excites me, but I wanna understand it more. Of how do we find that place where it flips and find it faster and more, get it more sticky so it stays longer? And if anyone knows what to call that in real words, I'd appreciate it. Um, but can we predict it and can we exploit it? Can we get it to where they start to see it and they start to um, be able to set up a program to encourage it? Usually patients tell me this in hindsight. Um, and I think we, I'd love to do better than that. Um, and how can we best identify and eliminate the barriers to using the tools that we have? As that's both from the, from the patient or client perspective, but also from the therapist in um, making this whole biopsychosocial concept one word instead of three words that are hyphenated. Um, and it's, we don't go do the social part over here and then this part over here, but we could all, all do that together. Um, and then make it interesting and fun for both the clinician and the patient, because why do it if it's not? Um, and we know that, that doing things that are fun help our internal chemistry too. We heard that you're supposed to give someone else a back rub for the, you know, if I really wanna help myself, I'll give you a back rub or go punch someone. That one didn't go, <laughs> it was my take home. Um, Okay, and then if you have any reasons or comments that you'd like to get a hold of me, I pretty much live on Twitter. It's my research staff. Um, if I don't have access to libraries, so if someone says, this is an amazing paper and I wanna read it and all I get is the abstract. Um, I have friends on Twitter and some of you are in the room, thank you, that send me PDFs when I say help. Um, so it's, that's really amazing, and as a clinician, there's great research being done, but if we don't have access to it, that's very frustrating. Um, and then email anytime and come on by Chicago.
nailed it on the time. <laughs> Thank you very much for that talk. Um, we have uh, a, a bit of time now for some Q&A. And so uh, we have uh, uh, people participating online as well. So if anyone has a question that you would like asked, we, such as this one right up front, and we've got a microphone coming here. Um, thank you. This is really great. And I didn't even know pelvic pain existed as a problem until about two years ago when a client came in. So people don't always tell you mm -hmm. that they've got it. Um, so I don't know very much, but one of the things I'm curious about how it fits into this whole picture is um, uh, interstitial cystitis, which I understand is like a chronic inflammation that's hard to treat because it's not really in the cells like. So how does that fit into all this? Um, they're kind of going, they, they being those who make names of things, are going to the, um, uh, oh, help me out here, I just forgot it. Bladder pain syndrome. Thank you, bladder pain syndrome. Um, the, because interstitial cystitis is supposed to be inflammation in the lining of the bladder, except for it's often diagnosed as that and there isn't any inflammation. So they switched the name of it and the, um, the organs hurt too, sort of. Um, but we're, we're all alive. It's, it tends to be a, a diffuse pain. Um, so what can we do about it? Uh, help them positively cope, uh, avoid triggers, but still have a life. Um, and, and not be afraid to move. Because if you've ever had a UTI, and you, like, you want to go run, and it feels like your bladder's bouncing from your neck to your toes, that's a very uncomfortable feeling. If you walk around like that every day, they tend to not move, which makes everything worse. Thank you. We have another question here, off to the left. Alice, you beat me to it. <laughs> um, so, so I can ask my second question. Um, I often hear chronic bladder pain talked about in the same context with other chronic pain conditions like irritable bowel syndrome, chronic fatigue, and fibro. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what your, I'm, I guess I'm wondering two things. One is, what's your opinion about that? And two is, when you have people who live with these long-term chronic pain things, especially when every day is a new adventure and you don't know what's going to hurt most from one moment to the next. Um, I'd like to hear more about your perspective on, I wrote it down, but I can't find it now, uh, you know, on making things interesting and fun for both client, uh, or both. Uh, uh, um, in, a, in a definition of a, a life that is pretty much sucking at the moment? Yeah, that's pretty, um, yeah. That's how I talk. The, um, it's tough. And, and that's where I go back to the what can you do, what can you do in five minutes a day that is, even if it's not great, it at least is less bad. That might be where we have to start. Um, and then try and expand from that. So in those kind of diffuse and long-term conditions, you, one, you're part of a team. So there's, there's a physician that's following them. There's all, a lot of other things. Uh, all of the pelvic health issues tend to have a lot of uh, centralization around it just because it's scary, um, not to minimize it at all, but there's, like with ICS, it's, when you, when you know that you can't eat anything because you're gonna hurt, because that's been your experience for the last 12 years, it would be very interesting if we could have someone eat and not know they were eating. Because then you could see if that really was true. But there's all of that expectation and learned responses and things that, that our very clever system will inflame something because you looked at food. Um, hard to separate that out. So we just do education, get them doing fun things, get some mindfulness. It's a, it's a complicated process, but it is changeable. And as Bronnie said so beautifully earlier, we're not gonna tell anyone they will be out of pain, but we can help them to cope and to have a life 
even when it seems like everything you've been told is you just have to give up everything you love. Uh, that's really not fun. And that's, again, why I like the PCS, because talk about hopelessness is every, if you looked at the ICS diet, my goodness, you get like water, yeah. lettuce maybe. We have a question uh, from one of our online participants. This question comes from Brian Rutledge. Can you give an example of offering evidence around a current belief where the belief was recently provided by or reinforced by another healthcare practitioner which your patient is working with? Oh. Also, oh, there's a, an, an additional question. As a massage therapist, how would you suggest we do so when the other provider is considered by society uh, to the patient to have a greater degree of authority and knowledge? Asking for a friend. Um, yeah, they, um, <laughs> that's hard because as professionals, we want to act like professionals and we don't want to say, well, they're a jerk, so just ignore them. Don't say that. Um, because guaranteed, don't say that because you're going to be the one that, so one way, if you've got that situation, the best thing to do is talk to the other professional so that the patient doesn't end up in the middle but also talk to the other professional because I know there are people out there that think that I told them things that I swear I did not say. Um, and, and that happens. So I want to try, I will get cranky when those situations arise, but I try and remember that, that what that person told me that they heard might not be what that person said. Um, so you want to check. Uh, and then I forgot the other part of that. How do I evidence against something? So if like someone comes in and I have a, um, I've had people in the past, I'm HIPAA scrubbing this. Um, so a guy who was told that um, his, his pain was because he had an anteriorly rotated pelvis and a leg length discrepancy and a rib out of something and you know all of these very biomechanical things by someone that they trust greatly. I choose not to call that out I try and work within that framework without saying words I know are wrong to get them into a better place. It makes it really hard, and that's why I want everyone to be really good at pain science so I don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> we had another question in the back row. The winner of all the books. And, uh, and, well, and then the next question will come from over here. Um, I'm asking on behalf of a friend who, um, well, uh, having, uh, she was, uh, during, uh, while giving birth to her son, she suffered a a hernia um, that uh, uh, has produced a consistent um, sensation of, of pelvic pain. Um, and she asks, since insurance won't cover an MRI if a hernia is not sticking out, how can one figure out if a female patient has an occult hernia aside from landmarking the typical pain pattern? The patient says there is a slight bulge, a pea size, that comes and goes um, near menstruation, but not every cycle. It's random. I am very surprised that I have an answer to that that is sensible, because normally I would say not a physician, not going to go there. But uh, real-time ultrasound can be very helpful, and there are many pelvic health therapists of assorted types that have that skill and training um, and physicians that are ob guys and such that have that skill and training to be able to do that. And it's done in the office. Uh -huh. So I would say that. Do my brilliant pelvic health therapist in the back of the room have anything else to say? Well, my comment was that's not how hernias, sorry. My comment was that's not how hernias behave. So I would also, even though the patient feels like that's what she has, I would probably explore that a little bit more and, and see what else is going on. And so, tend not to be cyclical with your right, period. Right. But I would defer to a physician at that yeah. point. I would certainly, I think any time you need to look at getting credible evidence that the tissues are healthy. And if you have that evidence, then there's other things that you could look at. Maybe some tissues are tight or there's some things that are weak or again, that central pain mechanisms may be creating some problems. Also, if her primary complaint these are, is... These are the pregnancy people in the back? I am not a oh. pregnancy person. <laughs> if, um, so if, if pain is her primary complaint, I mean, we've spent a fabulous couple of days talking about how structure and anatomy and mechanics might play into it, but also might not. So, um, so even that belief that the hernia is the thing causing the pain, I'd encourage her to find a really good pelvic floor therapist 
um, who knows her pain science or his pain science, and to, to have that evaluation and see if they can make her have less pain and discomfort in spite of the fact whatever hernia may or may not be going on hasn't yet been addressed. And that's the best thing. What do you do when you want to figure out what to do? That would be my team. <laughs> so our next question comes from the front of the far side of the room. Hello, Sandy. Hi. Uh, great job. I just had a quick question. Um, many of the patients that I think maybe a, quite a few people see have multiple areas of pain. So we may have pelvic pain, but we also have low back pain, um, a lot of stress and tension. Uh, many of my patients hold a lot of tension, like through their paraspinals, for example. And so in order to kind of kind of change that neurotag, so to speak, I want to try to get them to activate their, their abdominals or their core. And sometimes I, I don't want to create harm if, if there's at risk of creating more tension in the pelvic floor. And I was wondering if you could answer, is there a way to kind of determine when we should shut it off or is it okay to turn it on? Can I rephrase that and you can tell me if I got it right? Yeah. Um, if, um, so you want to, wanting to know essentially how to safely get movement through the pelvic floor in a way that's not going to create more spasm if it's there. Perfect, yeah. Excellent. Um, yes. You're not going to let me get away with that. Um, it's, so if I had a person that I was worried about that, because the question is how do you know? Right. You know, how do you know if, if you guys make a fist, you know you're making a fist and you could look and check in case for some weird reason you couldn't feel your hand anymore. But if you're clenching your pelvic floor and you've done it for so long it doesn't even feel clenched anymore, it might feel normal. And you could be saying, relax your pelvic floor. And they're like, yeah, I am. And an internal assessment would say, no, you're not, <laughs> because we can feel it. Um, so sometimes which, that's- Which I'm not doing. Well, we can, we can team up. Um, sometimes that's helpful, the real-time ultrasound, you can see it. But one of the quickest ways to biologically get your pelvic floor to relax is to get into a nice deep squat if you can. If you can't, get on your back, put your knees up like you're in a squat but that way. Um, and it opens up the spaces a little. It's not going to do that to it. Just take some pressure off so we get to use the physics and then diaphragmatic breathing. And you can put them in a place where they are most likely less tense. Um, but then you want to grade that back into where that they can jump, like Greg was jumping off the stage, and um, that, those loaded environments and have it be able to contract and then relax again, because that's normal. So probably have to assess it and then come up with a plan that addresses it. But if it's been tight for a long time, you, people don't usually know. And sometimes it's not. Yeah, I find I do a lot of core with my patients um, just to kind of try to get them to relax their back. So I'm just, I don't want to do harm by creating but it might, more tension through but the pelvic But we don't know if there is more tension there. Right. That's And the system is made to where, so that we don't pee on ourselves, um, which is convenient, to when you increase inner abdominal pressure that that's met by increased force in the pelvic floor. So you don't want a uncontracting, that's not a word, pelvic floor in when there's force up above it. So there does need to be that. Um, there's, there's some really cool stuff you can do, but find a public health therapist near you. We, we, do have, we do have another either question or comment to come in, in the back of the room. Uh, but while the microphone's heading over, just um, you said there's something that you said in a conversation that we were having yesterday about, um, you know, for home, simple home home exercises that somebody could do if they've been having a lot of sensitivity. Yeah. If you could talk um, a little bit about the example. That well, like, well, I think last night I was talking about sitting on one of those therapy balls because because the ball is round. Um, because when you sit on there, you get, and sitting is comfortable, you can get the pelvic floor to relax down onto the ball. You can get some of that sensory awareness. So just sitting on one of those therapy balls and moving around kind of fidgeting, like I tell my patients to pretend they're four and just play. Um, Can you clarify what you mean by therapy ball? The big round ball. Okay. That one right here. Okay. It's blue. Um, they, you can get them at Target and all those places. What the rule of it is that when you sit on that, your knees should not be higher than your hips because that's kind of like riding a tricycle and it's not very comfortable. So it needs to be either straight out or a little higher. Uh, so you're up and then just relax. 
the muscles will work and because you won't fall off the ball, but those ones can, can relax and just be soft and do their normal work. Thank you. It's the absence of effort. Um, I just wanted to comment on Kara's question for a moment because I think it's a really good question. We're just um, finishing up a study actually in, in Ontario at McMaster, my, myself and Sinead Dufour. And what we did was we look at women who come to an orthopedic practice with chronic low back pain because we know there's a lot of studies that have shown historically that chronic low back pain is related to pelvic floor dysfunction about three quarters of the time. But our question really was, um, because what physios tend to do is what you're doing and strengthening their core and, and giving them kegels and those sorts of things to do. So what we did, um, we looked at women uh, who came to an orthopedic practice and we assessed their pelvic, flo pelvic floors. And uh, what we found was that 90% of women actually who come to an orthopedic practice with low back pain have pelvic floor dysfunction. So they either have incontinence, prolapse, constipation, pain with intercourse. And that about 83% of those women are over recruiting their pelvic floors. So the question is, is Kegels the right thing to do? Is core training the right thing to do in the way that we've typically done it? And, and maybe, maybe, I don't have the answer to this, and I don't think any of us do, but maybe that's one of the reasons that core training, as we have typically taught it through the transverse abdominis, hasn't been all that effective for low back pain. Maybe we're already over-recruiting part of that system, and we need to think about that piece. So that's the first part to that study. Um, so what I tend, because we do teach a course for orthopedic therapists uh, who do not do internal palpation, um, and one of the things that we do is, is give them a suggestion to look at some of Eric Franklin's work, which is much more dynamic and less tension producing. And so you're going to get less of that building of tension, but still some work through their inner core. So I hope that helps a little bit. Or a really nice segue to Todd's talk. And Todd's talk is excellent, right? Uh, one last question. Uh, for, for, for folks that have that are seeing patients that come in and they seem to have some kind of pelvic pain or pelvic floor uh, concerns. Uh, if they do not themselves do pelvic floor work, where can they find somebody that they can refer to? That is great. Um, in, in the United States, the American Physical Therapy Association has a cleverly named find a PT option um, and we're identified on there. There is a section on women's health that may be changing its name because boys have pelvises too. Um, so you can go there. Um, Canada has a couple different places. I'd suggest getting a hold of Carolyn. There's a women's health division with the Canadian Pain Society. The Australians have a great pelvic health. So that's out there all over the world. And the easiest way to do it, honestly, over than all of that is get on Twitter and ask for the hashtag pelvic mafia to find you someone in the area. There's a great story to why that's the name. But Twitter is a really good um, way to find someone. All right, thank you.